have to invest in more game gear clothes. The only problem is I don't know what game this actually is. It's like a faux Zelda sort of thing, but people keep asking me, what game is that from? I'm like, no, they'd know that. Anyone that who's geeky enough to know what game is that from? <laughs> All right, it is 6.30 on the dot, so I'd like to get started. Welcome, everyone, both live and on Twitch, to tonight's STEM Cafe on eSports. We have ourselves four lovely presenters, and we'll have a panel at the end to talk about all about the eSports involved. Um, for those who are new to STEM Cafes, this is a ter time-honored tradition that goes way, way back. Uh, for us, only a few years, but overall around quite old. The idea is to gather people in the community to talk about the hot button topics of today's age, all about science, technology, engineering, and math. We're happy to be here in Northern Illinois University, those who are uh, on Twitch, that's where we are. Um, and we're going to be, uh, be going over quite a few interesting topics. I want to thank the Founders Memorial Library for hosting us, as well as Einstein Cafe around the corner. Those who are, uh, are interested in eating food at Einstein's, let you know that there is no table service, you'll have to actually go up and get it. I also want to thank Janine East up in the front for organizing all of this lovely eSports things, as well as Judith Diamond, who is unable to make it today, who also helps organize STEM cafes. Now, enough of me. Uh, I want to introduce uh, our very own Dr. Lisa Freeman, our new president of Northern Illinois University. So I'm very happy to be here kicking off this particular STEM cafe. And I just want to tell a little bit of a story of how we got here. Just about a year ago, I went to represent NIU um, at the Mid-America Conference, our athletic conference. And there was a conversation among the presidents about eSports. And could the MAC be doing things to support eSports at our schools and set up some type of competitive framework? And I will say that I was not alone among the MAC presidents in being fairly ignorant about what eSports were. So about two days after the MAC meeting, I came back and I had the privilege of hosting the presidential scholars, um, all of whom, as you might imagine, are much younger than the MAC presidents. And I asked them about eSports and learned that some of them had financed a good bit of their education with their eSports winnings from high school tournaments. And that all of them were really interested in seeing a presence of eSports grow on our campus. And so having pledged to let good ideas come not only from the top down but from the bottom up, I walked over and talked to Ann Kaplan, who is the Vice President over Outreach, Engagement, and Regional Development. That's a division that is very good at fostering collaboration across departments within the university and across external and internal partners. And Ann and I hatched up a plan to have an eSports initiative that would be managed by Janine East, who put together this evening's thing, and the rest is kind of history. Um, it's sort of very appropriate that this eSports cafe is this evening because uh, my chief of staff, Dr. Matt Streb, who knows about as much eSports as I do, is actually representing NIU at a MAC meeting in Cleveland. We were, all the MAC universities were asked to send somebody knowledgeable about their eSports initiatives, and, and Matt certainly is knowledgeable about the initiatives, thanks to Janine. Um, to come forward and talk about what we're doing. And in contrast to a year ago, when really only Miami of Ohio had an eSports program that was going on, now more than half of the MAC schools have made a significant investment in eSports, very much looking forward to setting up some type of competitive framework, and the MAC may be a vehicle to get some more corporate support. So uh, it's great to be here and to be able to learn more, and um, I thank all of the students, as well as Janine and our alumni who played a role in getting us to this evening and thinking about what esports could mean for alumni engagement, for boosting our enrollment, for engaging students on campus, and for engaging faculty who want to study various aspects of esports and um, time arts, animation, and the related computer science disciplines. So thank you all for being here, and I'll get out of the way and let the program begin.
Okay. Thank you, Dr. Freeman. Appreciate your time and being here. Uh, our next person I want to invite to this front is Liam Buchanan. He is a senior in Comp Sci and the former president of the NIU Esports Club. We have the current president with us right here. Uh, Liam helped expand the club from just a few members to over 50 active members. And he coordinates community competitions in Rocket League, Overwatch, Super Smash Brothers, uh, Hearthstone, and League of Legends. He himself competes competitively, or plays competitively, and streams Hearthstone. Uh, up here he is, Liam right here. All right, th thank you so much, Sam. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here tonight. The esports pro program here has come a really long way since I picked up the club. Um, geez, it's about three years ago now that I took over as president after the previous president, Dan, uh, left it to me. Um, I do want to, I'll go ahead and go over our panelists here. We've got a great board, and I think you guys will all be uh, very enlightened by what they have to say tonight. So I'll just start uh, with the one closest to me and move on down the table. I have Connor Vagel here, who joined the eSports Club last year and has been instrumental to many successes. Uh, he helped found the eSports program at his high school in Rockton, Illinois, and broadcast League of Legends matches at the University of Missouri during his freshman year. He's the current president of the NIU eSports Club, as has already been said, where he puts his communication major to good use as a coordinator and broadcaster for NIU's League of Legends eSports matches as of last year, now president. Connor attends collegiate and, e and professional eSports competitions as a spectator, and when he can't attend the live matches, he watches them on YouTube and Twitch. Right next to Connor, I have Eric Hoffman. Eric is an instructor in the NIU English department for, uh, focusing on the integration of technology in, in writing courses. He's also an avid gamer. As a co-guild leader in the massively multiplayer online game or MMORPG called Rift, he, is, he has first-hand experience in negotiating the various issues and challenges relating to managing a competitive gaming team, particularly the pressures of high-stakes competitive gaming and the impact of communication tools and gaming on player social interaction, which is a critical tool on any esports team. Right next to him, I have Claire Zvosek. Claire is an assistant professor of sport management in the kinesiology and physical education department at NIU. She has co-authored two manuscripts related to esports in the college setting. One studied what motivates coll collegiate esports athletes and the other examined collegiate esports players who receive scholarships to play at the varsity level. Claire is interested in how esports can be mutually beneficial to both students and higher education institutions. Last but certainly not least, we have Eileen Click, who is the current NIU Esports Club faculty advisor, and she has a doctorate in instructional technology from NIU. As the director of the NIU Digital Convergence Lab, she runs video game design camps and esports boot camps for middle and high school students. Her, dis her dissertation research focused on the lack of female participants in gaming, and she sees opportunities in engaging girls in technology through video game design. And that's all of them. I hope all that you all be uh, very, uh, very attentive on what they have to say. They have some great presentations prepared. I'd like to thank a few people myself uh, for being here tonight. Of course, Janine for all her hard work on bringing, bringing us the step up from club to uh, university endorsed. Eileen for her work as faculty advisor. Uh, our previous faculty advisor, Sean Takoon, who is unfortunately no longer with us, was instrumental in making sure the club even survived this long to make it to this point. And of course, Mark, who has come out tonight on his own time as part of, as a club member to help work on the tech board. Thank you all so much. All right. That's it. Hello? Okay. So, I'm actually just going to hold it then. All right. So, we have the, uh, I'm going to show a little bit of a video here. It was produced by Riot Games last year uh, after the World Championships. Um, it kind of gives a little bit of an intro to what I'm going to be talking about during this presentation. So, it's real short. It's about two and a half minutes, and I think you guys are really going to enjoy it. So, if you guys want to roll. Have you guys seen eSports and the eLeague? I don't know if that's sports, uh, but, but it's a know, great sport. If you're mind seen it. But I don't know if athlete is the right word that I yeah, would go for. You don't break a sweat. I don't consider it a sport. No, you, no, you do. Yeah.
watching people play video games isn't like watching people play football. It's like watching people play fantasy football. It is one more step removed from human activity, you understand? It's video games. It's, it shouldn't be on a sports network. It's video games. But can it truly be a spectator sport? Um, it already is. 71 million uh, watched it last year. They reckon it's going to, by 2017, it'll be 145 million people watching it. They're actually giving college scholarships for video, for video, for video gaming. You're kidding. Uh, and it's even gone to the point that now, the government has acknowledged video professional video gamers as athletes. Same way you watch a football match, you can hear the crowd, everyone's cheering the team on, you make friends, these are people you talk to, you play with online. It's all about community, it's being part of something that you're incredibly passionate about. Running for Barrett though right now, trying to establish vision control and for oh, and he's and he's 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 that and All right, so that gives just that gives just a little bit of an insight into uh, what esports are. Uh, really focuses a little bit in on League of Legends, a little bit more than other games there, because that was a video uh, produced by the directors of uh, League of Legends. But so to me, an esport is a competitive video game played in such a way that it is kind of like a sport. Um, you, in a lot of them, have one team facing off against another, or in some of the newer ones you have a bunch of teams facing off against each other in a kind of a, a big tournament setting. And so with that, um, it, is the, it allows the inclusion of everybody because you don't necessarily have to fit a physical uh, build or anything like you would if you were gonna play baseball or football or basketball. Anybody can play an eSport and that's kind of the beauty of it. Um, and so it opens up to a lot of opportunities. Like we have here at NIU, the eSports club, which allows us to uh, have competitive sides of things. So we have teams that go out and they compete, as well as there's a casual side to eSports. So anybody can get involved and they can play these games and they can really help out with however they want to. Um, and it, that's the beauty of everything is that it just kind of is allowing for everybody. Um, so to go a little more in depth on what esports are and why it's a big deal, it, it's because the finances are really getting there. It, it's not just something that is done in a niche market anymore. It's something that if you take a look at the numbers, uh, League of Legends World Championships, for example, last year had over 52 million concurrent viewers for the finals, which is an absolutely astonishing number because when you compare that number to the NBA Finals, the NHL Finals, or any game of the World Series last year, it beats out all of those on an international stage. And uh, so that really just sets it up for, there's the viewers that are watching these games, there's money that's involved in these things, such as for the international, Dota 2, uh, their premier competition worldwide, the prize pool for that last year was over $25 million as, uh, as a crowdfunded experience. And so there's not just these, um, as that video kind of pointed out, it's not just an, a thing that's done on the side for a lot of people. It's a thing that is really starting to turn some heads and is really starting to uh, show that there is the financial aspect that this could be the next big sport that is out there, that people, are watching it in Korea and hailing the athletes of esports as much as, if not more, than their professional athletes that you'd think of traditionally. So you'd think of someone like, um, in, in that video, Ambition was mentioned, and in there you saw some pictures of a player named Faker. And in Korea, those two are looked at as 
the same things as maybe a Michael Jordan in the United States. And that's some of the really interesting points is that eSports allows for people like those guys that are just, they, they might not have the same capacity to play um, in a traditional sport to go out there and make their names as champions in eSports here. Um, so they, there's the financial aspect, it's getting big. There's the growth of it as people watch it. Um, streamers in eSports as well can make enough money to sustain themselves. Um, so recently, ESPN produced a couple of articles in ESPN the Magazine as well as a video on the uh, streamer Ninja who plays the video game Fortnite. Um, and he's self-sustaining in that. And he, he started as a competitive uh, Halo player and he's moved into streaming Fortnite because it's a game he found that he loved. And he's able to stream with the likes of musical artists like Drake and Travis Scott, and as well as NBA players have joined him on stream. And so this is not something that's done just by the niche nerdy market out there. It's something that there is the big markets that are jumping in here. And athletes like Rick Fox have uh, found themselves investing into esports when, uh, such as was shown in the video, he owns a team Echo Fox. Um, the team NRG is co-owned by Shaquille O'Neal. Um, so there are a lot of NBA teams that are getting involved in this, NBA athletes. Um, competitive leagues for everything exist out there. So if you have an interest in esports, you can really exploit it because of things like FIFA being an esport uh, for soccer. NBA 2K has the NBA 2K League that they've introduced, which is um, 19 teams now from the NBA have invested into having, uh, they have actual uh, personas in game of their, um, of their gamers that go out there and they have, they represent themselves in a 5v5 competitive basketball game in NBA 2K. Um, and the same thing is known, is starting up in Madden as well as NHL and then you have games like League of Legends and Dota. You have Hearthstone, which is a card game. You have really, for, you have one person games, you have multiple person games, you have a whole breadth of things. And so that's why esports may not necessarily be the next sport because it may be a new category outside of sports that kind of is separate because it is so widely developed in different genres and you can take it so many different ways. Um, so I, I think at this point, I'm running close to my time. So I'm gonna let, uh, I'm gonna move on to the next panelist, but we'll, I'm sure, get some questions about what are esports and that sort of thing as the night progresses. So if you guys have any questions, we'll have that at the end. Thank you guys. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Eric. I work in first year composition, but as uh, the introduction said, I've been a avid gamer since I was very, very small. Um, so what I would like to do tonight is kind of go down the rabbit hole a little bit, um, speaking of nerdy niche people, um, and kind of own that a little bit and talk about my experience as a guild leader within an MMO and my experience in rating organizations, because I think that is a perspective that people outside of the gaming community may not have a good sense of what that kind of looks like and some of the issues that are involved when you try to manage people who are separated by space um, and sometimes by many, many, many time zones. Do we have the PowerPoint? Cool. There we go. So the name of the presentation is Competitive Gaming and Community Building. So I'm just going to say advance. <laughs> there we go. Excellent. Um, so one thing that before I want to uh, really get started to do is to give a shout out to my co-guild leader from my gaming days, whose name is Siv. Um, as we've been talking about this the last uh, couple of weeks, one of the things that we both realized is that calling each other by our real names instead of our game names was really bizarre because I don't think of him as Mike, I think of him as Siv. And he thinks of me as Lily and not as Eric. Um, and I'll kind of loop back to that in a minute. So I just kind of want to lay out a little bit of terminology. The kind of game that we're talking about, that I'm talking about, um, is a massive online game such as World of Warcraft. The specific game that I have a lot of experience with is something called Rift. Think of it as World of Warcraft. It effectively makes no difference. 
Um, and the, we can, oh yeah. The kind of com competition though, the competitive game side comes in the form of end game. So real quick, the basic premise of all of these games is that you start as a low level one kind of person, you go through the game, you do quests, you kill rabbits and boars and whatever else, and eventually you get more powerful and then you end at the level cap, let's call it level 70, and you've got all your nice shiny gear and you're the maximum level, and now there's nothing else to do. So one of the things that the game developers did was to develop end game content. This end game content is designed to be incredibly complex and incredibly difficult and the kind of content that individual people cannot do by themselves. Most of this end game content is designed for team play and the kind of end game content, the raid kind of content that I'm talking about, is designed for 20 person teams. So if we go to the next, we are already there, awesome. Um, so the kind of end game content that we're talking about, one thing to kind of keep in mind is that the kind of player who's going to join an end game guild, which is really just a collection of players who hang out with each other and have common goals and common objectives, these kind of people have typically already put in 500 hours into the game, and I can say that is an incredibly conservative estimate. Most of the people who are in end game guilds have spent at least a thousand hours in game, sometimes more. The act of being in an end game guild in tackling these incredibly complicated kinds of environments and scenarios usually takes between 20 and 40 hours a week, every week, depending on the kind of guild that you're in. So if we switch, the next thing that I want to show, and we can just switch to it and then pause it real quickly, it's the video. Um, what I want to do is to show you an example of what a raid looks like. So just to give you some context, this is a 20 person raid. What we're going to be looking at is a very, very short clip of the last boss of the last encounter of this very complicated raid. And my hope is that this brief 40 second clip is going to give you a sense of the kind of coordination and focus and precision and communication that these sorts of competitive environments demand. Roll clip. Look away around. All right, good job, guys. Back to Crucia. Back to Blue and Crucia. Keep on DPSing. Survive. Remember, watch everything that's going around around you. First and foremost. Doing good so far. All right, here's the lasers. lasers. If you're a little further away from Crucia, there's less lasers. All right, I got her. DPS team. Monkey Apple, Battle Res, Cinnabon. Turn around, look away. Let's see, we'll pull out the Monkey Apple. Good job. Keep at it, guys. Don't stop. Watch the lasers. Keep on looking all around you. Battle Res, Multi. So let's just leave that screen on for one second. So what I'm hoping to demonstrate is really a few things. Number one, there are 20 people involved. There are about eight or nine different game mechanics that everyone has to be aware of at all times. And if any one of those people loses track of any one of those eight or nine simultaneously mechanics, they will die. And then the raid is gonna get in trouble and you can see from the middle screen, the black little bar, that is someone who has died. The other thing that I wanna point out real quickly, and I'll pick this up, is you can see there's, this is a really complicated screen, right? There's a lot of stuff going on here, and if you're not used to these kind of interfaces, it looks like pure chaos. One of the things that I wanted to do to kind of, uh, kind of reinforce the element of competitive gaming here is that if we look at some of these different kind of red screens, these are all different metrics that are used by the team to assess performance. This is a metric that describes how much damage each player is doing per second. This one is describing how much healing is done per second. This one is showing how much damage each individual player has taken and how often each individual player has died. That's okay. Um, <laughs> make that into a diff later. So, I, I think we're gonna wait on questions until the end. So hold on to it for now. So one of the reasons that this is important is that all of those different metrics are used to judge performance and in some ways to judge who is going to be invited into the next raid, who is not, and who's gonna get kicked out of the team. 
right? If you have enough people dying often enough, that's grounds for getting removed right away. The fact that this video even exists is another metric, right? This is a way that a lot of professional sports teams, you tape the game. You tape it, then you play it back, you go back and you see what went well, what didn't go well, what can we improve on, who is screwing up consistently time after time. Okay, so if we could go back to the PowerPoint. Excellent. So I want to kind of pull back from the details of the raid into talking about kind of what is a guild. So these guilds are typically 40 to 50 people, sometimes a little bit more. And one of the things that make these esports unique, and it certainly was true in our case, is that the members are distributed geographically. We were an American guild, so most of our members lived in the continental US, distributed generally between East Coast and West Coast. But we had a couple of people who lived in Europe, we had a couple of people who were in the Middle East, we had one person who is in Australia, which obviously introduces some very complicated logistics in terms of communication, in terms of setting up times, and so on and so forth. One of the other elements that's introduced here is how do you get to know your teammates? With that amount of precision and coordination, it's really important that you act as a team. There's been a lot of research done that suggests that players who choose female names and players that choose female avatars are treated differently than players who choose ma masculine names and masculine avatars. My character name was Lily, based upon my daughter's nickname, and I chose a female avatar. This confused the bejesus out of most of our guild members until they heard my voice and the fact that I identified as male. The fact that the identity accrues over time, right? It is not meet each other over five minutes. It's you get to know each other over weeks, over months of competitive gameplay. The last thing I'll mention on this is voice chat is absolutely critical, certainly for rating, but really for any esports that has distributed membership. You need to have something like a Discord server or some other method of synchronous communication, or you have no kind of communication and no kind of coordination. Generally, there's two types of guilds, and if we could go to the next one. There's what I would identify as a hardcore guild. These are the for real, for real gamers. They generally raid five times a week. Je players are generally expected to put in at least 40 hours a week of actual game time raiding. They tend to have very authoritarian kinds of structures. It's a very top-down authority model. When players screw up, they are penalized for it, and eventually they are kicked out of the guild. On the other edge of the spectrum, you have casual guilds who generally raid two to three times a week, generally it's about 20 hours. They tend to use more cooperative models. They tend to use a more distributed governing uh, framework. I, our guild was somewhere in the middle. It's called a semi-hardcore guild in that we had certain features of a casual guild in terms of distributed um, authority and more cooperative gameplay, but there were elements of authoritarian structure in there that if people screwed up often enough, it was not up to a vote whether they stayed in the guild or not. It was a top down, we kick you and you're out and there's really no recourse for any action after that point. <coughs> Next please. One of the things that um, I talked to about my friend Siv when I was preparing this is the elements of any successful guild. And what he identified was any essential guild, it really consists of two kinds of people. One is gonna be your champion. And I'm glad you brought up the idea of the champion and some of the kind of famous names in, in uh, game playing. The champion is the person whose individual gaming aptitude is so much better than everyone else's that they're the person who makes the guild grow. They're the person, that's your superstar. That's your Achilles, to use a Homerian reference, right? The downside, again using Homerian reference, is that Achilles does not always play well with others, right? Great individual prowess, not always a really good team player. So accompanying Achilles, you need your general. You need someone who can manage the troops, who can create a conducive environment in which people will actually play with each other. The downside to that is, and I was one of them, I was one of the guild managers, is that the amount of time that the guild manager has to put in to calm down all of the fires that Achilles sets is enormous, especially if Achilles is having an off week, which happened pretty frequently. Next, please. So what we did as a guild was to describe three different um, paradigms to create our guild success. 
One of them was objectivity, a second one was a fair reward system, and a third one was a shared governance system. Next, please. Objectivity, and this will be no real surprise to, I think, anyone in this room, if we think about the fact that most organizations like NIU have something like rules that are posted, they have laws, there are bylaws, even on a department level, you have rules that are codified that express the kinds of behavior that are expected of the people in the department. That's what we did for our guild. And by codifying all of those rules, by codifying all of those regulations, when we talk to the players, instead of our rules coming from the arbitrary authority figure and looking like they were arbitrary, we could point to a document and say, look, it's right there. Here are the, the rules and the regulations and the code of conduct that everyone has agreed to abide by. Next, please. The second, the reason that you join a raiding guild in the first place is because the harder the encounter, the better the loot. Everyone wants the shiny. That's what raiding guilds are all about, right? You want to get the nice shiny loot. Raiding bosses, by definition, drop the best shiny loot. So one of the things that we codified was the way in which those things were distributed. And if we could toggle over to the spreadsheet. This gives you a sense of the algorithm that we use for loot distribution. It's called a DKP spreadsheet. The details of exactly how that DKP distribution don't really matter. The fact that there is a complicated algorithm to determine who gets rewarded what is the point that I'm trying to make. The goal in creating this kind of complex algorithm is to reward good behavior, people who show up on time, people who show up regularly, people who follow the rules, while at the same time leaving incentives open to recruits who we want to come in, right? If we can go back, please. The third element that we incorporated was a distributed governance system. And again, this is not going to be particularly surprising to anyone. Instead of having a single top-down authority figure who just kind of declared, here is the rules and that is that, and that's all there is to it, you can imagine in your head a flowchart that looks very much like a shared governance flowchart uh, with the guild leader on top, and then we have class leaders and then individual members under that. The value of having a distributed governance um, mechanism was that instead of one central authority figure, we could distribute that out and to make sure that when players had questions or problems, there was an immediate person who they could talk to and then uh, a system by which they could have their, their concerns addressed. So the, the idea that I want to leave you with is when I'm thinking about team management, the kind of hybrid system that we ended up using was remarkably successful. Our players generally lasted between six months and 12 months, which for this kind of online system was pretty good. There were some downsides. Number one, the guild management time allotment was enormous. When our guild leader had to quit because uh, they were pregnant and had a child, the guild died within a week. Number two, at no time during those three years did a female ever occupy any leadership position. Number three, the, the rules themselves were enforced um, not arbitrarily, but not evenly. It turned out that there was a very specific equation that basically said, we measured what you brought to the guild versus the amount of conflict you caused, which basically meant in practice our champion could be as big of a jerk he wanted, and no one did anything about it because we all knew, and he knew, that if he left the guild, progress stopped. As a result of that, a lot of people left the guild, particularly women, because he could be super toxic to a lot of players, and he knew how to get under people's skin, and all of our female players at some point said, not worth it, and I cannot blame them. I'm not trying to defend our system. I am trying to convey a sense of one reality of how competitive gaming works and the kind of community and the kinds of issues that are involved when you have a distributed population who are communicating each other with, re with each other remotely in this kinds of high stakes systems. Thank you. Thanks, Eric. Um, my name is Claire Savosic, and I am an uh, assistant professor in the kinesiology and physical education department, uh, specifically sport management. So Eric took the route of very technical, obviously a very avid gamer. 
Um, I'm going to switch it up a little bit. To be perfectly honest with everyone, I'm not a gamer. Uh, don't really have any interest in ever becoming a gamer, but certainly respect your all's commitment. And uh, as you'll see with some of the things that I'm going to talk about, um, I certainly respect the value of uh, esports in sort of its various roles in higher education and how it's becoming a, a booming industry at the professional level. So a little bit, I guess, sort of an outline of what I talk about before I get into the, the nitty gritty details. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, this esports, is it a sport, is it not a sport debate. Uh, I'll talk about how esports research is or is not valued um, as a legitimate form of research within the sport management uh, field of academia. Uh, I've co-authored two manuscripts on esports uh, in the higher education, higher education setting, so I'll talk very briefly about those. Um, and then I'll sort of wrap it up uh, with some information about potential roles for esports in higher education. Uh, so to start off with, with the is, is esports a real sport or not debate? Um, I think we could probably take a deep dive. I'm sure Connor would um, argue adamantly for the fact that it should be considered an e or that esports should be considered a sport, I'm actually going to take uh, a little bit different route to arguing whether or not esports should be considered a sport. I honestly don't even think the debate matters because the fact of the matter is it's here. The industry is booming. It's generating revenue, and people are interested in it. Whether you want to argue whether someone's mental capacity and finger speed necessitates them being a quote unquote athlete. Like I said, I'm not sure that it really matters. So uh, I know you're probably expecting some sort of long-winded debate from me in that regard, but I just the fact of the matter is I don't think it matters, right? If it's being covered on TV, if people are investing millions of dollars in it, if corporate sponsors are willing to shell out millions of dollars for sponsorships, if these professional eSport athletes, or with or without the quotes, are generating millions of dollars a year, it doesn't matter if it's a sport or not. This is something that's worth studying. It's something that's worth talking about. So um, a little bit about how esports research is or is not valued within sport management. I'll tell you a little bit of a story. Um, it's about three years ago, and as part of uh, some research that I'm doing as part of my doctoral program at the University of Kansas, we collect some really awesome data on esports. We interview 33 student athletes, esports student athletes, at an institution that I'm not allowed to reveal. But they are receiving athletic department scholarships. So their funding is coming from the athletic department. It's in a, at an NAI institution. Um, it's not at an NCAA institution. So we collect this awesome data. We write up this awesome manuscript um, about sort of athlete, identif athlete identification. And we submit it. There's, in sport management, there's really two journals that are considered the top journals in sport management. We submit a manuscript to one of the top journals. We get a desk reject from the editor. And what he says in his sort of rejection email for his desk reject is that esports isn't a sport. It doesn't fall under the umbrella of sport management. It's not, this just isn't a fit. Go submit elsewhere. Now, the academic in you wants to send this nasty email to the editor right away to say, please read to page two of the manuscript, and you will see our argument for why esports should indeed be considered a sport. So that happens, right? This is a top level journal in sport management. Not even six months later, this same journal comes out with their sort of biannual newsletter. And the leading column in their newsletter is esports and why we should study it. So the you know, person who's just trying to get publications so they can you know, get a job after they graduate with their PhD wants to throw a chair against the wall. Uh, the rational person in me said, you know what, this is actually really cool because you're starting to see esports gain its own legitimacy under the umbrella of sport management. So now um, people try to publish articles on esports all the time in sport management. I think part of the research group that I was with, we were the first crew, so to speak, to actually gather data. We weren't just m making musings and sort of these academic articles. We collected actual data. So some of... Um, the information about the two articles that I co-authored. Uh, it wasn't exactly salami slicing with our data. We collected, uh, we did semi-structured interviews that ranged anywhere from 15 to 45 minutes long with 33 eSport athletes. We wrote up this huge manuscript. 
Uh, after it was desk rejected from the first uh, journal, we submitted it to a second journal, and they said, this is great, but we think you just have too much information here. You're trying to cover too many topics. So we sort of broke it down into two different manuscripts, and that's sort of how we got uh, into two different articles. But the first article was about um, athlete identification. So do these eSport student athletes that are receiving money from their institution, from their athletic department, to come to that institution, do they view themselves as athletes? And probably not surprisingly, the answer was yes, right? This is really competitive, we dedicate so much time to this, we view ourselves as athletes. But what was really interesting about this is they talked about how being in the same physical location with their teammates was something that was new for them, right? Because in high school they were really avid gamers, but they could be uh, in Illinois and their best friend is someone that they game with all the time who lives in California. So now they're in a college environment where they're practicing 20, 30, 40 hours a week in the same actual location, and they talked about how it opened up this whole new dynamic of sort of friendships. I don't want to say real life friendships, because right, one of your best friends is someone that you game with, but you're not in the same physical location with them. So they talked about how that was so important to them. So they talked about their own athlete identity, but they also talked about their seemingly lifelong battle with sort of a quest for legitimacy, right? So although we're eSport student athletes, although we receive scholarship money from the athletic department, everyone on campus kind of turns their nose up at us, right? We've got, we've got the athletic department gear, we've got the athletic department backpacks, the t-shirts, all that stuff, but people kind of maybe laugh at us a little bit when we tell them we're eSport players and, oh wait, we didn't know you could get money for that, right? So that was something that I think um, was really interesting and I want to be sure that I get this quote in here because I think it's hilarious, but also very uh, relevant is one of the interviewees said, um, we're just trying to make people know that we're not, quote, a bunch of uh, basement dwelling neck beards. <laughs> so <laughs> a, bunch of, a bunch of people that just play games in their basement, and as Connor talks about, right, like this is more mainstream. This isn't just a niche bunch of nerds hanging out in their parents' basement playing video games. Um, so that, that whole manuscript was all about athlete identification. Then our second manuscript was actually about uh, motivation of these eSport athletes, right? And we talked about these different tiers um, of motivation. We talked about extrinsic motivation, intrinsic motivation, and burnout. So from an extrinsic motivation standpoint, it's pretty obvious, right? They're coming to that institution because they are receiving scholarship money to be an eSport student athlete there. And at a lot of these NAIA institutions, um, you know, they'll have 1,000 or 2,000 people on campus. So it's pretty much an enrollment tool for the institution. And a lot of these eSport athletes, we ask them the question of, would you have come to this institution if not for this scholarship? And they almost unanimously said, no, we would not have come here. But this was an opportunity for us to continue something we love. We were going to go to college no matter what. If we can match that together with this institution, it's something that we're going to be interested in. So they talked about the importance of that extrinsic motivation in the form of that scholarship. They also talked about intrinsic motivation. When, when, he, when he's up here talking about you're in a, what, a semi-serious, what is it called? Semi-hardcore. A semi-hardcore that is 30 hours a week there's got to be some sort of intrinsic motivation for wanting to do that, right? It's the competition that you're going to get out of it. It's bettering yourselves. That's something that a lot of the interviewees talked about quite a bit is it's sort of a, a competition with themselves to see how much better they could get. But not surprisingly, they also talked about burnout, right? Where it's, yeah, this is something we really like to do, but in order to be competitive, in order to have that extrinsic entity that is their scholarship, they have to be good, right? Because that's something about eSports is it's all measured, right? It's very easy to tell who is the best, who is the worst, sort of where you fall on that ranking scale. So they talked about dealing with burnout because they knew they had to be practicing all the time. Yeah, they went to practice in their sort of eSports arena for four hours every day after class, but then they had to go home, do their homework, and then practice on their own for another two, three hours to sort of sit, stay competitive, so to speak. So um, those are just some general themes that came out as part of the research that we did. Um, I guess I'll shift a little bit, and I can, I'll talk for a few minutes. I could talk for like 30 minutes about the next topic, but I'll, I'll keep it short and sweet. Um, just some basic sort of information about roles of esports in higher education. I think, um, there's an opportunity here at NIU. I know there's an interest in developing courses related to esports. 
I know me specifically, I've worked with our department chair to have an elective offered in the spring that is sort of a sport management of eSports class. Um, so I think there's an opportunity to generate interest uh, in that regard. I know there's clubs uh, here on NIU on a lot of campuses to try to get students involved. Uh, I, I already talked about sort of the student athlete scholarship model that's going on at some uh, NAIA institutions. For those of you that don't know, um, when comparing the NAIA to the NCAA, the NAIA is usually a little bit more entrepreneurial or sort of wild, wild west of trying to adopt uh, new ideas, new opportunities. So I think you'd be more likely to see something happen at the NAI level before the NCAA level. I'm sure President Freeman probably has her own opinions on that. Um, so, um, but one of the things that I think is really interested related to trying, institutions trying to attract eSport athletes with scholarship money is I would almost compare eSports, and I'm curious, maybe later when we have the Q&A, curious to hear your opinions on this. I think the scholarship model or the scholarship attraction of esports could align itself with something like men's tennis or baseball in the sense that you can be six, you're talking about high school, high school esport athletes paying their way in college with some of the earnings that they earned in high school. Well, with this amateur model you have at the NAI level and NCAA, you're not going to be allowed to be an officially sponsored sport and be able to earn that prize money. So what you could see is something similar to what happens with tennis and baseball, of if you are elite, elite, elite level, you'll just go straight to the pros, right? You'll be like, um, I don't know, choose your uh, famous baseball player, famous tennis player, where they just didn't even go to college because they knew that they needed to maximize their earning uh, revenue potential window as early as they possibly could, so they just skip college. So you'd see something like, uh, you go to college, if you're still really good, but you're not gonna be able to earn a million dollars a year as an 18 year old kind of thing. Um, I know there's summer camps that, that NIU offers. I, I know you're gonna talk about that a little bit. But one of the things, I, I guess just to wrap my portion up that I really wanna emphasize is that I think there's a hesitancy to talk about, we wanna offer esports opportunities on campus, whatever that looks like, because we want students to come here, I think there's a hesitancy to talk about, th talk about that. Like, we're trying to use people to enhance enrollment at an institution. It could be NIU, it could be any other institution. But what I wanna emphasize is that caring about providing a quality student experience, whether that's through a club, whether that's through scholarship money, whether that's through uh, courses that you have, Caring about those enrollment numbers and caring about a quality student experience doesn't have to be mutually exclusive, right? Like I can say, you know, I wanna start an esports major here because I want to try to get another 200 people on campus. That doesn't mean once you get those 200 people here, you're just gonna chew them up and spit them out and not care about them as people. So I think that's something that's important to emphasize, especially sort of in the climate that we're in, not just at NIU, but higher education in general of declining enrollment and needing to find creative new ways to attract students. So I think um, eSports certainly fits in that model of trying to be creative and cutting edge, what have you. So I'll stop rambling. I'll pass it on to you. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, following to faculty who teach in front of a classroom all the time, it's gonna be a little hard. I'm not used to speaking in front of an audience as often, I teach online um, in the College of Ed. I'm also the director of the Digital Convergence Lab, which is here in the library, and one of the things we do, as I said, is community engagement, and that includes um, providing video game design camps in the summer for um, middle and high school kids. We're planning on eight to nine weeks of camps this coming summer. Two of them, I think, are gonna be um, eSports focused. That's what we're looking at right now. Um, as part of that job, one of the things I noticed um, was where are the girls in video games? I'm a mom of three kids. I have a son and two daughters. They all play video games. Uh, I started with my daughter when she was 10 playing World of Warcraft. She quickly took over and surpassed me. So I don't know, I'm a gamer mom, I'm a gamer, I'm a teacher, but I don't know if I'm a hardcore gamer like, like some of these guys, but I do play games. Um, Connor said, it should be pretty easy for anybody to get into esports. Doesn't matter your sex um, or build, or, or even if you have a disability, you should be able to get into esports and compete um, competitively. 
But then Eric said, where's the leadership in the females in his guilds? And I think that's what I'm going to talk about in, well, that's what I'm going to talk about in my presentation. So you want to go to the next slide? So this is my advertisement for my, in, in 2009, we opened our first video game design camps here at NIU. And this is my advertisement. It's, you know, a couple girls, boy, playing video games. Um, was kind of excited about our first camp. Uh, and then um, the next slide. This is the reality of our video games design camps. They are 99% boys. We might get a girl now and then. She's usually the sister of one of the, guy, one of the guys in the camp. And um, as I was looking at my dissertation at, the, at that time, my teacher said, well, you should focus on getting data on something that you're close to that you can get data on. And so I said, okay, what I want to do is I want to start a Just for Girls video game design camp. And I really got a lot of pushback from people on that. They're like, you don't need to do that. This is co-ed. It should be equal. People should be able to join equally. Well, I pushed for this so that I could get a group of girls together to study. Um, the next one. Okay, so I'm looking at who is playing video games, and just for data for my dissertation, and the Entertainment Software, Software Association is one of those associations that studies this. They have partners with Ninten or Nintendo, Epic Games, a lot of the big companies are a part of this association. Um, and so I think the perception was that most video gamers were boys, nerds hanging out in the basement, <laughs> um, those were the main people who play video games. But um, according to the data that comes from them, um, that there are 64% um, you know, of households own a device. Gamers average 34 years old. Um, more than 70% of video games are um, gamers that are older than 18. Adult women represent more video gamers than boys under the age of 18. And the next slide. So the average female, the average gamer, um, female gamer is 36. The average male gamer is 32. 45% of video gamers are women. And the next, next page. So in doing my research for my study, I was, I was also talking to people who were in the video game production um, business. And why is that important? Well, if you have 45% of the gamers are women, um, I was finding out from, from company or from people who represent companies or work for companies or data online that only 11.5% of the people developing video games are women, and most of them are in marketing and HR. So the the industry itself that's developing these games are not represented by women. And, um, you know, in, our, in, 19, in um, the mid-1980s, when I graduated with my bachelor's with my husband, who was a computer programmer, he went into computer programming consulting with um, a large firm, and there was a lot of women. I, I mean, I never really thought about it in computer science. And so... Um, but then when I was doing my research for my dissertation, they said we were down to 25%. We went from 37% women in computer science to 25% women in computer science in 2011. And then at that point, undergraduate, um, females in undergraduate programs in computer science was down to 12.5. So in eSports, I just found out recently, it's 5% of, of pro gamers are women. So where are these women in um, eSports? video game production, gaming, I and mean, we were gaming, why aren't we in the profession, why aren't we competitive? So I googled women in esports, and I came up, these are the top, top five results. And um, I did pull different information from these that I'll talk about, but I think one of the ones I wanted to point out on this was number four. There's a 718% pay gap between males and female esports champions. That's, that's a pretty big difference, <laughs> I think so. So I, everybody asks, you know, and they hear it's what I was working on in my research, and um, they want to know what they think, what I think the reason is that women aren't going into um, developing computer games, why aren't they going into esports, and um, between my dissertation working with my girls on um, video game design camps and this presentation, I came up with a couple of top reasons. 
number one, and we hear, I hear this from everybody, I talk to women around campus, I talk to other gamers, is the toxic environment. They're, they're nodding. I'm, I, this isn't something that's, um, that's new to anybody in the gaming industry, any of female gamers, they'll talk about that. And we want to point out, though, it's the silent min minority. Um, people don't know who you are on the other side of that game when you're playing a multiplayer game. You're anonymous in a lot of ways. And so it's really easy for the toxic few to make a lot of noise and cause a lot of discomfort for women in gaming. Um, so that's our number one. Number two is marketing. In, um, I think I pointed out earlier that in the mid-1980s, we were kind of a peak in computer science in that it dropped down. And I, I had a feeling that maybe computer games, computer games were now available to be purchased for homes. Um, people were playing games on their, on their um, PCs, but it usually meant you had to add an extra video card or do some extra things to it. Um, so I was looking at the game consoles in, in particular, and Nintendo um, was coming out with a console game around that time. And marketing decided, well, where do we put this in the stores? And what they decided was in the boys' toys department. So the game you know, was all immediately identified as more of a male toy than a female toy. And so um, I think that parents really have a part in this as well because they're buying toys based on genders sometimes for their kids as well. I kind of saw it starting in my own family. My son had the consoles and then he had the computer and he was taking it over all the time and my daughters weren't getting access to it. And I finally said to my husband, we got to get another computer in the house because the girls need equal ac access. Um, and so, and that's, so that's what we did. Another thing that um, Anita Sarkeesian, am I saying that right? Um, a feminist frequency uh, a couple years ago, right around the time I was doing my dissertation, actually around 2013, 2014, she did a study on female characters in video games um, up to that point. And she found a, a very strong lack of, fe of uh, a lack of strong female characters or they were very sexualized. And so they, so they were either, you know, needing to be rescued or they were scantily dressed. And she found that um, in talking and meeting with women that um, they really were having a hard time finding games that they felt that, you know, met their expectations or needs as demonstrating who they are as players in the game. Um, and then right around the same time, um, a... Oh, and the next number one. Yeah, thank you. You're keeping up with me just fine. <laughs> um, right around the same time, a gentleman who was working in the game development industry, his name is Luke Crane, on Twitter asked, you know, why are there so few women in the game as game creators? And the internet exploded that week, and it was very exciting because I was working on my dissertation, and it's all this great data. And um, women just went off on saying um, what has happened to them in their experience as gamers or working in the game development industry. And uh, the next one has a few of those tweets and I kept it to the mild ones. I didn't really push or present some of the ones that I felt were a little uh, on the racy side. Um, because I got blank stares when I asked my female, I asked why a female soldier in a game I worked on looked like a porn star. Um, because I still have to keep saying, but what if the player's female? Or because if I succeed, I'm exceptional. And if I fail, I'm proof that women shouldn't be in the industry. On the next slide. So someone took and got a hold of all these different tweets and looked at the different themes, and here's how they broke, up, broke out. Um, gender assumptions, rape, and sexual harassment, overt sexualization, silencing in the workplace especially, and harassment. Over 7,780 tweets were analyzed for that. Um, and then next, you may have heard this in the news recently, Riot Games was, was accused of a toxic workplace. So finally, people are starting to speak out, you know, the why me, things like that. I think people are starting to speak out and say, you know, we really need to get this into conversation. Without talking about it, it can't be fixed. So we want to talk about it, and I think that's why I brought this up today and is my part of this presentation. Um, so Riot Games, a, a, 
a report came out, it was written inside the culture of sexism at Riot Games. And um, Riot has acknowledged that there is a problem and they are actually taking steps now to change their environment in, in their um, company. So that's a good, another good step forward. Next slide. So I don't think we're at the tipping point yet, but we're st starting to make progress as far as getting more women into video game design, into, into eSports. Um, and this is just a few examples. Um, Sasha, she's the top player right now, has made um, almost $200,000 playing StarCraft. Uh, her male counterpart is at $506,000. Although Catherine plays Halo, Reach, she has made $122,000. Her male counterpart has made $45,000. So there are some um, really good female players coming out recently. I want to point out at NIU, our current eSports roster is at 20% female, and that's great. <laughs> and finally, um, my Just for Girls video game camp, um, I feel like we're changing the world one camp at a time. <laughs> um, we get girls every, every summer to come and they really open up in these camps. They're much different than the girls who are in the co-ed camps who kind of sit quietly in the corner and don't say much for the whole week. The girls in the Just For Girls camp um, feel more comfortable, they, they interact, they get crazy and loud and all those things we want them to do. We let them Skype with video game designers um, that, to show them the kinds of jobs they can get and, and to talk with designers about what the job field is like. Um, in all of our camps, we talk about behavior and respect, and we show a video um, on toxic behavior, and we try to teach all of our young women and, and, and gentlemen how they should be behaving, and I want to point to Becky right here. She's our teacher for our camps, and she's been, this is just one of her passions now. She really speaks very passionately with the kids about this. Um, and my contact information. Thank you. Thank you very much to all of our panelists. We're going to take a five minute break here in a second, but before we do, I want to say that Dr. Click's video game camps um, are actually really cool. They're for uh, elementary, right? Um, middle and high school. Middle and high school. And I want to point out that uh, one of NIU STEM Outreach's student workers, who's sitting back there behind the computer, actually started as a camper, and one of his camps was video game design camp. So, hi, Cornell. Thank you for coming. <laughs> we are going to take a five-minute break. Those who are on Twitch, feel free to take a minute to go to the bathroom, grab yourself a drink, whatever. And in five minutes, we're going to come back. We're going to do a question and answer session. So, brainstorm some really good questions, some hard-hitting questions. We want to... Uh, get the most of our, our, our panelists as possible. So again, about five more minutes and then we'll reconvene. Thank you.
We have about one more minute before we get started again. So go ahead and uh, start taking your seats, throwing trash away, wrapping up, and then we'll get started in about 50 seconds. Okie dokie, everyone. Welcome back. For those who are on uh, on Twitch, for those who are not on Twitch, we actually have about between 10 and 15 uh, virtual participants uh, watching at the same time. So if you're looking around thinking, where's everyone? They actually are online. Um, before we get started, I want to introduce a few of our other things we have going on with NIU STEAM. Uh, upcoming, we have, uh, in October 23rd, is our other STEM cafe, uh, entitled, uh, the, it's a Frankenstein, ah, Frankenstein's Legacy, which is all about uh, the past, present, and future of anatomy and synthetic biology. That is going to be Halloween themed, but also a lot of STEM involved in that one. That one's going to be on October 23rd here in DeKalb. It's at Fatty's Pub and Grill, so if you're in the area, hop on there. Uh, it's all the same time, 6.30 to 8.30. Uh, it's on October 23rd. A few days after that, October 27th, is STEM Fest, which is the biggest event for STEM all around the area. We have 8,000, 9,000 people come through our doors doing all kinds of great hands-on fun activities. It's great for kids, teens, and adults. And this year, we have our inaugural Mini Maker Fair, which is all about artistry, invention, creation, people who make things. Both events are free at the same time, same place. Both are from 10 to five at the NIU Convocation Center. We hope to see you there. Um, as you ask questions in the audience and uh, panelists as well, make sure when you ask the question, make sure you have the microphone close to your mouth. If you, so make sure you have the microphone up to you. And wait until you have the microphone before you ask the question um, as that will, uh, this is recorded. All right, so uh, I will start at questions in the audience. If you have one. Microphone to your mouth. Oh, yeah. Is it? Okay. Um, I want to ask the previous president what motivated him to take over the club when he saw that it was failing. Hello. Uh, all right. Thank you. Uh, I can go over that a little bit. So um, I wouldn't necessarily call the club failing, but it was trying really hard to do a lot of things that w just weren't working. Um, and they didn't quite quite seem to to realize that just yet. So um, when I took when I took over the title, I basically just inherited it. I was the only one who wanted it, the presidential position. Um, I sat down and I tried to think to myself what what could make the club grow, what what was being done wrong, what 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 needed to be fixed. And I realized that what we were lacking was a central community. There's there's something about gaming, the community, the players, the people. It's not just about all that. It's about the, the heart and the mind of the player and the people that you meet. Um, there's just something that clicks between you and that other person, between you and the whole room. And in order to grow that, what better way than a LAN party, right? I did those with my friends in high school. We all love them. It was fantastic. It was a great way to meet anybody. Um, you can talk about all the games that you play, uh, and everybody will be able to sync with that right away. So launched with that, um, and those are a massive success. The LAN, now they're now called the LAN meetings because they're a combination meeting LAN party. Um, and then the other thing, the background to that is how was I gonna make an executive board work? Because if you look at esports clubs across the nation, e previous esports clubs, one of the things that really kills those clubs is um, uh, people, w players want to do something, and gamer the gamers want to do something. The problem is, is nobody actually wants to do the work for that. So you have to recruit a strong core to really make those things happen. 
and also fit with the um, the NIU structure of an executive board. So there's two dynamics to work on there. So I tried to run it as I would, like almost like a business in a way. Uh, that's kind of how you have to run things in, an, in a successful esports organization. You can look at professional esports teams and see this too. So I, have, I set it up. I contacted all the people I had met over the course. This is just my first year at NIU. So at the end of my first year at NIU is when I, when I um, became president. Um, over the summer, I recruited everybody I could think of. The people from the original executive board that I saw were working really hard to try and make things happen, but just didn't have enough support. People that I had met from hackathons, people I had met from orientation, everybody I could think of that you know really loved gaming, but also had a determination to make things happen. So that was my core executive board, the original of president, vice president, secretary, and treasurer. And then after that, we recruited coordinators to lead the teams, and the rest of it's history and what you see before you today. Thank you. We have a question from uh, Twitch. The Gambling Goober asks, for better or worse, what studies have been performed to determine the effect of appearance or aesthetics on success for men or women gamers in esports? Um, so I'll take one crack at that. When I was doing the research for this presentation, um, I looked at a lot of modern stu current studies within the last four years about guild, guild membership, um, role of gender, different kind of organization patterns. Um, and one of the studies that I looked at was specifically dealing with World of Warcraft and the reaction of avatars upon player reaction. Um, I don't have the reference with me, but I can certainly get to it. And I was just talking to Al with Aline with this over the break. The fact that I uh, played female avatar with a female sounding name um, definitely makes a difference, right? Uh, generally, players either treat you like you're an idiot and that, and just generally ignore you, or they white knight you and come in and like, oh, do you need help? Here's a bunch of stuff, and here's some money, and here's some equipment to get you started because clearly you don't know what's going on. Um, so I, I didn't intend that to happen, but I used it. Sure, I'll take your free stuff, you know, once I get there. Um, and there were a couple of people who felt betrayed when I when I when when they heard my voice and were like, "Oh, you're a guy." I'm like, "Yeah, I'm a guy." Um, and I don't know whether it changed their perceptions or if it really made any big difference, but I definitely noticed a difference. And there have been a number of both studies and books that have been done upon um, avatars and gender and the relationship between uh, com communication, online communication. I can talk a little bit about this too um, from a couple different perspectives. I think one of the ones that really did come to mind just now though is um, in talking to my daughters and at some different conferences I've been to where women will say they always pick a male avatar when they're playing, or not always, but I mean many times, especially in some of the first person shooters and things like that, because then they're treated better. If, if they have to use, they try to avoid using their voice, um, if they do, use their voice and they find out they're female, again, they feel betrayed, they start getting trash talk and different things like that. In another kind of similar sense, um, I know TJ Lusher, who, Dr. TJ Lusher, who's here at the library, she was getting her doc, doing her doctorate um, at the same time I was, and she was using Second Life, and she, um, we were holding classes in Second Life with Sharon, Dr. Sharon Smaldino's class. And um, one day she showed up in like, I don't know, it was like goth with tattoos and everything with her avatar, and she, and the, she felt and, and was discussing with other students, they felt uncomfortable around her because she was dressed in such a manner. And so she decided that this was an area she wanted to do some research on, and um, she found that fascinating. Back. Well, I was gonna say, do we have questions out here that we can Hi, um, I wanted to ask, um, Eric, you had shown a 20-person guild raid. Yeah. How big of a monitor or monitors is a person using to be able to have all that information available and make it useful while you're, you're, you're working? Regular, a regular monitor size. I mean, there's nothing particularly fancy about the monitor size. I will say the the screen that we saw uh, was the guild leader screen, so not every player needs a DPS meter and needs a healing meter, right? So the complexity of the screen that you saw 
was really particular to the person who is measuring a series of metrics. So it's not necessarily that every player is going to have a screen that complicated, but yeah, you get used to it. Okay. I, I have a, a different question, but, but similar. Let's go on this. All right, so every person that's being part of that guild and has reached that level and is playing at that level obviously has shown some competency to do so. But at that level, how easy is it to coach another player on what to do and get better before they just get dropped out? It depends on their attitude. Um, it depends on the guild structure. It depends on, so hardcore guilds are not interested in coaching at all. They are interested in um, recruiting elite players. And if they um, adopt someone who they determine does not meet their standards, they'll kick the person just right there and then. More casual guilds or semi-hardcore guilds, um, we do adopt a more kind of uh, mentoring kind of relationships. And that's uh, why we have class leads, to help nurture people. Um, and one of the things that I didn't mention, but I think goes along with what Aline was saying, um, we had people in our guild ranging from 15 years old to 65. Uh, we had grandmothers in the guild right against the people who would be like, AFK, my mom is yelling at me right now, right? Um, the, and there's a wide range of experience, life experience, experience in games, and a, a very wide degree of personalities in there. So some of the guilds mentor, and um, in many cases, a player can be good, but there's a degree of experience with rating that until you, you start competitive gameplay, it's a new environment. You can be good at single player. You can be the best person in the world at a game. Once you enter a competitive relationship that requires very, very close coordination, it's a completely different environment. And I think mentoring is really important there. I I have something I think I could add to that as well, um, especially on the aspect of coaching. When you look at more of a professional level of coaching, it usually is less about the actual gameplay um, because at this level, the the competitive gamers know what they've done wrong most of the time. You you know your mistakes that you're making most of the time, especially when you're watching back that footage. Um, just like a professional athlete would know, you know, that shot probably should have been taken here versus there. Um, and so a lot of the times coaches in esports are not as much about the actual gameplay and learning like what you did wrong. It's more about the mental uh, aspect of things. So um, like why you might want this versus that or a lot of uh, sports psychologists are getting into that um, into coaching. And so uh, most of the teams that are having a lot of success right now are hiring sports psychologists on to really deal with the pressure of situations, to deal with um, how team play might work and that sort of thing. So coaching in esports is a little bit different from traditional sports, uh, at least at the collegiate and high school level. It's more along the lines of what you're looking at at a professional level in traditional sports of this coach is more there to kind of say, okay, here's how we're going to rally back from this deficit that we're at because we're not necessarily going to do this specific thing. We need to get into the mental shape to do this. So it's a little bit different in that regard. Thank you. Uh, so many questions, actually. But um, just a couple. Uh, do you see, with the sportification of, of video games, do you see games changing at all? I mean, have you seen the games evolving to kind of meet a different type of player um, and then also, uh, you, with a lot of video games, you can actually play the computer. And do you see AIs becoming a part of, of esports in the future, or are they now? Yeah, anyone. I can uh, take the, the first one. So you asked um, if games are evolving to meet the demands of competitive play, right? So um, yes, absolutely. It's, it, it's actually become a very serious problem for the growth of the esports industry because the client and the uh, so you have you have your client right that the players are playing on you have your streaming and you have your casters so you need the client to be able to work well for the players connect to the competitive experience the tournament wherever it may be you need the casters to be able to understand what's going on and have access to all the information they need to report on the experience which may not be known to the player they need to know what's going on on both sides 
the players can't know what's happening on the other team. So it has to be separate. And you have to have the streaming experience be, of course, fluid and there's no problems because if nobody can watch the game, nobody's interested. Um, a good example of this is with the current Hearthstone scene. That's the game I play competitively. Uh, it's a trading card game. It's similar to Magic the Gathering, but in digital form. Um, and currently, we're seeing a big problem with tournaments in tournament mode. They wanted to bring in a, something called tournament mode to the game that would completely um, smooth over the experience of the Hearthstone Championship Tour, which is currently relying on third-party software and the casters kind of just having to guess at what's going on at times because the client is so poor at handling the competitive experience. Um, and just recently, they put out an announcement saying that the tournament mode is kind of off the table for the foreseeable future. And let me tell you, people are not happy about this. They're all, all the competitive players, everybody who wants to hold tournaments, we, uh, we as a club um, are not happy to hear this news because it's critical to have that infrastructure in place in order for us to run a successful tournament. Third parties shouldn't have to grow your game for you in order to handle a competitive scene, especially when the company itself is is hosting a, um, a competitive circuit for it. So um, the, answer, the short answer is yes, absolutely. The long answer is um, while the call is there by the, by the majority of end game, and as, as Eric was saying, end game and uh, competitive players, um, it, it's just a matter of the, the um, developer of the game responding to that demand. One other element I uh, put in, and this is more responding to the second part about um, PVE, player versus the engine versus player versus player. Certainly for competitive esports, player versus player is king. There's no question about it. But one thing that I think we haven't talked enough about is Twitch itself. Twitch is a game changer, absolutely. In the last few years, um, the number of people who have started making their living by uh, streaming their gameplay, whether that's PvP or PvE, um, one of the games that I play a lot is called Path of Exile, which is basically a solo player game, and there are many people who make um, hundreds of thousands of dollars a year because they stream on Twitch, and they have followers in the thousands who will donate money daily to because they're entertained because the person and the character and the personality of the person they're following on Twitch is so entertaining that they will give those people financial support. So I think Twitch, the influence of Twitch upon the gaming community cannot be overstated in the way that's evolved over the last three, four years. Thank you. Um, if you would uh, also want to share a comment or thought other than a question, that's totally fine as well question actually sure. Sam do you mind sure okay so wait, wait, where's the, mic? the mic is right here <laughs> okay <laughs> okay my question also has to do with technology but more on a personal level Connor you said that um, esports is something that that anyone can get into because you don't have to have a certain build or or you know that sort of physical stature but what about the technology? I love graphics. I do artwork on the computer. When I buy a computer, you know, it gets a little more expensive than the one that somebody down the street is using for email. But when I look at what I need compared to what they're selling for gaming, I am just like floored at the prices of what they're selling as gaming computers. How does a teenager get into that? How do you afford it? it that that's actually a really valid point. Um, and I think one of the best answers to that is the a lot of what they're selling for gaming is not necessarily what you need if you want to be an eSports player, to say the very least. If you want to be streaming high-level games in high-level gameplay, um, for some games, sure, you do need that, that high-end machine. So things uh, like some of more of the high-end games that the club might be playing, then we're going to need some higher-end equipment for. But things like League of Legends, you could, the, the joke in the community is that you could run that on a toaster, and that's not too far off from valid, uh, from being valid. I mean, the, the way that 
esports started was as an advertisement for the game itself to try to draw more people into playing the game by watching it. Um, and so to that point, most game developers have tried to make their their esports be as inclusive as possible of any technology. So you can run league on or in a lot of esports, not all, but a lot on um, you know some a computer that was built in the late '90s could still run it fairly well. You're not going to get the best performance out of it, obviously, because it is it has aged some, but you're going to be able to at least launch the game and you're going to see what's going on even if it's not at the highest graphical quality. So there, there is that barrier that you do have to have that internet connection and the computer, which can be a barrier to some, but you do find that it's not as, it's not as hard to get into as maybe, you know, if you were trying to do streaming, that can get you into a little bit more of a tough situation. And usually the price range that you're looking at for low end streaming or even, um, even like esports in that, you can typically find a budget that's similar to what you might find on an initial investment and in maybe like playing for a local travel hockey team or a local travel football team where you have to pay for your equipment, your pads, your cleats, a ball, everything like that, as well as your team dues. And you typically are running about the same cost there too. So it, it's, there is that level of entry, but I think that it ends up in the end kind of helping out to say the least. Hello? Hello, I'm Mike. My question is for Dr. Click and Lily. As a female player or avatar, it seems more difficult to earn respect in the gaming world. So what is it exactly that earns respect? Is it the shiny gold trim armor, a high level in power or magicka, or reaching that maximum level of 70? And then piggybacking off of that, once they earn one of, or all three of those things, are they respected by top players who have the same attributes or are they still kind of viewed as inferior? Can I, can I give this, the mic to someone in the audience to answer? I think she's much better prepared to answer it. I could answer it, but I think a, a new voice in this would be really good. Why don't you introduce sure. um, I'm Natalie Santiago. I, um, I'm an instructor, a PhD student in the English department studying um, what's called procedural rhetoric, which is uh, video games and rhetoric kind of combined. So um, I, I tend to study everything from developers down to the community. And as I've been observing things, I did a lot of research on competitive games and women. And one of my case studies is a girl named Gagori. I don't know if anybody's familiar with her. Um, she is number three ranked in South Korea for Overwatch. The first time that she succeeded in a championship, there was so much harassment and claims that she was cheating that um, she was you know, afraid for her life, essentially. So what we're seeing is when women are good and, and often what happens is you'll see, and from my experience in Overwatch, you'll be accused of cheating or using an aimbot so there's this disbelief that a woman could have that ability. Other debates where people ask, why aren't there women in esports? What we tend to see is men saying, well, your reaction time and reflexes aren't as good as men. So, and that's not true, okay? They're basing it off of one study that's already been uh, falsified. So there's a lot of issues with um, women gaining respect in any way, even after they've proven themselves, because often it's just attributed to cheating or um, you know, just sort of gaining favor in the community? I'll answer that from a, diff a different perspective. One of the things that I've found, and one of the reasons that I think I've ended up being a guild officer in basically every MMO I've played, um, has everything to do with text. Uh, the way that you get to know people, the way that you get to interact with people before you get to that end game rating guild is textually. Um, I was an English major. I, was a graduate English student for many, many years. And through syntax and vocabulary and the way that individuals within the game put words together, um, you get a sense of personality and you get a sense of respect or you get a sense of lack of respect. Um, World of Warcraft was famous for something called Baron's Chat, uh, where people would go to this one specific area and talk and um, a lot of ludicrous things happened 
But there's something to be said about identity formation and the role of textual representation within the game itself before you get to the level of, vo of vocal representation that people, people will make judgments upon the kind of person you are through the way that you represent yourself in text. And there are ways in which that's kind of gender neutral, right? Whether you're respected or not has more to do with how you say things than what it is that you're saying. And that's a feature of um, a lot of online gaming that I think is often overlooked, the role of kind of the, the performance of writing itself and how identity accrues over time. Um, so I'm, I'm going to ask a question to Eileen because you, you're a gamer mom as well. Um, one thing that I think is missing is I'll often speak to other parents and I'll say, yes, I totally game with my son all the time. And there's this kind of baffled um, look on their face and then this sort of, well, that's not really productive. They're not outside, right? And uh, what I've discovered is that more parents should be playing with their children. I'm not sure if you agree because I think the reason why you pick up these kinds of behaviors is you're seeing them emulated and there's no modeled behavior at an early age. So I just wanted your input and how you kind of um, went about that, um, socializing them for a gaming community. Hmm. <laughs> I mean, one of the, I went to some uh, seminars in, at the Games Learning Society Conference up in Madison, Wisconsin. It was one of my favorite conferences to go to every summer. And there was always a, um, uh, a panel on families that play together. And I was very inspired by it. And I was inspired especially uh, by moms and daughters playing together. Um, so unfortunately, with World of Warcraft, I would have had to buy two accounts to play with my daughter. And it's already a little pricey you know, on top of cable te television and all that. So my daughter and I ended up playing kind of turn-taking. So she would play, and then I would play, and she'd coach me. <laughs> and then she would play, and I would play. Um, and my son really, I, I didn't know what he was getting into when he, he was getting into stuff on the internet, playing video games, setting up servers and LAN parties out of our house. I didn't even know it at a very young age. Um, so, but he burned out quick too. And by end of high school, he's like, ah, I want to go outside and play. I don't want to play games. And then my middle child, um, she is married and plays in a guild with her husband and friends and in that situation she feels much more able to express herself as a woman in the game because she's playing with her husband and other people who are part of her team and so they're a team and they're, it's a little bit more protective in, in being a female gamer and some of these hardcore games that they play. That would have to go to the presidents. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so the question was, um, how did we retain? Uh, honestly, I, I I feel bad to say it like such a high number because twenty percent isn't even that high. Um, <laughs> but the. It's kind of a, a frustrating dynamic, right? Because at the club. We're all about the community, we're about the game, we're about having fun together. It doesn't matter who you are, it doesn't matter where you came from, it doesn't matter what you look like. Uh, we all know that when behind the screen, we're all the same. What comes down to it is skill and your sportsmanship. And so one thing that, w one thing that I did notice that was like a tangible uh, encourager to more women joining the club was we actually had to have women present in order to get them to come, to get girls to come talk to us. They're not going to come talk to me or the vice president. Um, they came up and talked to my girlfriend, who is the treasurer. Um, they were much more interested in asking her about how how the club worked, what they could get involved with, et cetera, et cetera. And they signed up. They, they were totally fine with it. So the more women that we were able to uh, pull to the club through our existing female members, uh, the more it kind of grew, and that's what's kind of kept it together, too, is because that community is now there. Um, and uh, another thing that probably helps us a little bit is out in the wild, wild west of the Internet, um, everything's totally unchained. 
Uh, people can respond in any way they want, and that's kind of why we have such an issue with toxicity is because of the anonymity of the internet. It's just an inherent problem with it. Uh, at the club, though, if I catch you harassing anybody, I will throw you out. I have no t The club as a whole has a zero tolerance policy on it. We don't want any of that in there, and we won't tolerate any of it. So it's it's a great thing within our community. It's a great thing that's moving forward in esports. Now, if we can just push it out to the rest of the world, that would be great. Okay, uh, we, do have, we do have more questions from Twitch. We have a question, I think, for Claire. Uh, given the continued comparison between sports and esports, how does the time commitment in esports compare to traditional sports, and does that time commitment pose unique benefits or risks? Sure. So um, I guess I can talk about it mostly at, at the college level when you're talking about, uh, I guess, more stereotypical athletes. So actually, um, when I was getting my master's degree, I worked in NCAA compliance in a Division One athletic department. And they actually, when they're in season, they have uh, what's called a 20-hour-a-week rule. So technically, um, you're only supposed to be practicing 20 hours a week. Uh, if you are a college student athlete, now that would be uh, casual, casual, yeah. right? Like you're way casual. You're not into the 30, 40 hour a week uh, standpoint. But everyone knows. And as a former, uh, um, I was a women's basketball player in college. And as a former student athlete, uh, you might be in official practice or games 20 hours a week, but you're going in. You're doing your own individual workouts. You're practicing on your own. So from sort of a time commitment standpoint, I would say. Uh, it's relatively similar. I mean, you hear, I'm not here to get into like a debate about amateurism and whether student athletes should be paid or not, paid or not. But when you're, if you're on the side of the debate where you feel like student athletes should be paid, uh, a big argument they make is quote unquote, being a student athlete is the same as having a full-time job. So I think, um, if you're talking about you're a serious gamer, if you're spending 30 or 40 hours a week, I would say it's probably relatively comparable. And I, I can follow up with that. Um, in the professional scene, if you look at the amount of hours that most teams are practicing, um, there's there's a couple of different ways to look at it. Um, the way that the future looks like is there's a lot of teams are investing into a practice facility so that they don't have to go about the, uh, the thing that I'm going to talk about in just a second. But um, even with practice facilities, most teams are having practice anywhere from 12 to 14 hours a day. Um, and so that's not including mealtime. That's time actually spent in game or going through videos of their gameplay and that sort of thing. So this is the same, if not more, of a commitment at a professional level that the uh, that traditional athletes face. Um, and the other thing I you look at is the way that some teams are still going about but is kind of falling out of favor. Um, but that is the prevalence of gaming houses where the team actually lives in a house together um, and with a gaming house even though you're typically practicing and actually awake 14 to 16 hours a day you're in a house with your team 24 hours a day seven days a week effectively um, and so for a good portion of the last five years or so in the U.S. and abroad you've looked at gaming uh, teams practicing upwards of 24 hours a day for most of their uh, for most of the week uh, most of their time so maybe a week vacation here or there but you're is, to specifically reference League of Legends for example um, they have a nine week split not including playoffs uh, twice a year so they go about 12 weeks that they could be playing if they make it all the way to the finals as, so they're practicing that entire time. Then they might have a season in between that. They have a two-month off-season that they might not even get to take as an off-season. Um, then they play another season like that. They then have another month break if they make uh, the World Championships, where then they play for another month in, for example, this year it's in South Korea. So they've now spent, they're spending six weeks in South Korea if they're a team that made the professional tournament. And then they're looking at the next true season starting uh, in January when the season itself uh, or the World Championships ends the first weekend in November. So if you put that all together, you're looking at maybe 
at, at most, uh, with getting back into practicing and everything, they might have a month if you make the world championships and then are coming back. And if you're living in a gaming house, that's a month of an off season for working and living with these people 24 hours a day. So it is a commitment that in traditional sports, you're not living with the team members and you might be practicing just as much if you're in just a traditional or a, a new gaming, uh, area so like what team liquid or tsm might have in the next couple of years but if you're in a gaming house it's it's a very different ball game to say the least i do want to mention one thing as a uh, as a follow-up to that you mentioned um the question mentioned risks associated with this and uh, my dad's watching right now so he'd actually love me to mention this hi dad um you see that right there on that sign it says promoting healthy gaming practice I'm really glad Janine included this on the initial draft of the sign because it's very important that um, unlike regular sports, esports athletes are not getting physical exercise out of this. They're getting exercise in a different way, um, but nonetheless, you still need physical exercise. So um, an important direction that needs to be kept in mind as we move towards this is that um, the esports teams, uh, Connor talked about living in the gaming house together. Um, I think that's great for just promoting those friendships um, those lifelong relationships with those people, both so you can communicate better with them in, in game, but also you know enjoy your time together. And so outside of that, there needs there should also be, um, and the direction the esports club will be taking is um, promoting physical exercise for the teams. Uh, many esports clubs already have this, where their teams actually have um, physical therapy instructors, instructors or um, uh, maybe not physical therapy. Sorry, that's the wrong word. Um, like. Exer uh, physical exercise instructors to kind of direct them to have uh, healthy exercise outside of the game. And they even do it together as a team. Um, and that can just be, you know, like an hour of uh, Frisbee golf or, or sorry, hour of um, hour of Frisbee, hour of uh, flag football or anything like that. Um, so it's important that we keep that in mind as we move forward. Thank you. Communication is uh, very important, especially when you're moving across time zones, moving across the world. How do you see language evolving as esports continues to grow? Uh, I, I can take this one. Um, so I have, uh, my major is actually communications, and my um, emphasis in esports is that I actually do broadcasting for the games. So um, what I'd like to get into in the future is actually doing um, at a professional level, the announcing for the game. So similar to how you'd have a color commentator and a play-by-play -play in baseball, football, anything like that, I like to serve as the play-by-play -play for eSports. Um, but that being said, you have a language barrier in a lot of eSports where uh, with South Koreans and Chinese um, regions being very dominant in a lot of games, you have uh, that language barrier like you're talking about um, when teams are importing, quote unquote, Koreans into the region um, to try to improve their performance. And so that has caused problems in the past of um, teams have to find ways to communicate when one player might be speaking Korean and the rest of the team speaks English or Spanish. Um, and so to that end, there's kind of universal names for things that end up going into effect. So, um, you know, champions are going to be, in, to use terms for certain games, and it's different for every game, but um, for something like League of Legends, the players that, or the individual characters that you choose, uh, each have a name, and that name is reflective in all regions. So even if the announcer is going to be saying whatever the announcement is in Korean, it will still use the English name of that champion so that that's a universal symbol across all regions. And so language in eSports, typically when you have that language barrier, is very minute thing. So you might say, uh, to refer to a certain ability, you might not use its full name. You might just say uh, Darius Alt. Darius Alt, 30 seconds. Darius Alt, 20 seconds. And that's how they communicate. Really short bursts like that that just keep... Um, their information, and it's very informational. It's not much about the actual content, so they don't focus on having long messages there. And that's why if you watch gameplay of something, even like League of Legends where there's only five people on each team, 
you're still having a lot of short bursts of information that is just getting kind of, it sounds like there's a whole bunch of people like shouting things at each other because it's like, this is happening now. And so we're saying Darius, this Darius, Darius, Darius. Oh no, Timo, Timo. Just, it switches back and forth and back and forth really quickly in really short bursts of information. And so it, it's really about how quickly you can process that information on the minimal information that you're given, especially when you don't have that um, that same language to kind of talk about more complex issues. So, one other <clears throat> sorry, one other aspect of that is competitive gaming is all about the ping rate, right? It's all about the speed at which your computer is sending information back and forth from the server. Um, and one of the things that every international game will do is have local specific servers. So when I'm playing a game, I'm not calling a server in Korea. I'm calling the one in Washington DC or in Dallas or in Seattle, um, which is then connect on their side, they're connecting to a local one as well. So typically when you have a guild, those guilds tend to be region specific. There's gonna be um, a German server. There's gonna be a, a Korean server. There's gonna be the American servers. Um, and those tend to be the hub of most organization and guilds. So there's already kind of a regional specificity built into the networking infrastructure of how the games are designed in the first place. How math is a universal language. Uh, it's kind of like that sometimes. Right. We have a we have another question from Twitch. Uh, you mentioned hashtag one reason why. How do you think we can make gaming more inclusive for women without making them feel uncomfortable? It all comes down to respect, um, and that's and that's what we try to teach in our camps. Um, that there's different levels of players and there's you know different personalities and as Eric was saying that whole communication especially um, I noticed it early on when I was in virtual worlds talking with people before we had any voice chat it was all text and it's amazing how much you can learn from people through text and actually become friends with them um, and so it's in the communication of gaming if people respect each other and um, you know, if they're they're there for the right reasons, or they're not there to um, destroy the game or destroy you know what's going on. It doesn't even have to be verbal. Sometimes it's just I'm going to come in here and I'm going to blow this game for them. That's respect. So that's what we need to teach. We need to teach our kids. We need to teach our students, and we need to not tolerate it in the games we play with each other. Disrespect, not tolerate disrespect. <laughs> Um, do you want to add to that? <laughs> I, I think there's a I think there's a little bit to some degree of a culture of respect that needs to be implemented from the top down. Um, if you look at I know in Aileen's, Aileen's presentation she um, mentioned Riot Games and Riot Games is the uh, to have full disclosure Riot Games is the company that makes League of Legends which is the game that I focus on the most personally um and in and since it's the game that i focus on most personally it is a company that i'd like to work for in the future that being said i understand that there is a problem with the culture that has existed at riot games uh, and to kind of get into that without getting into too many details um the culture of riot games is that it was founded out of a dorm room between two roommates uh, Mark Merrill and Brandon Beck, uh, they had u they universally designed the game in and of itself uh, of League of Legends based on a mod to a different game that they played together. Um, they dropped out of college and they found some investors and they made their game. They made millions of dollars off of it. They're best friends still. They still run the game as CEO and CFO. Um, long story short, it's two guys that are still kind of collegiate in a way in that not in a not in a bad way but they kind of have some tendencies to be a bit immature at times um, and so the way that the hiring process at Riot Games went was it was a quote-unquote bros first culture of and it was all about quote-unquote real gamers so real gamers were guys 
that were going out to the gym with each other, and then they were coming back, and they were playing a game of League of Legends, and they were like, oh, well, you're a good friend of mine. You're going to get this executive position. And that's kind of how things worked in some of the esports industry. And not every industry or not every company in the industry was like this, but the respect for actual talent within the industry was not always there. And so the way that that exhibited itself was top down that the game was made by a bunch of people that kind of had this idea that, you know, we're all bros and we need to be. The, the great friends and whatever. And so that was kind of exhibited in how the game was implemented. And so the from the top down, at least in League of Legends, you can see that there was a culture problem that led to disrespect in the workplace and in the gaming community that was tolerated because it was what was tolerated at the top of that game. So just kind of making sure that there is a culture of respect that gets implemented, especially in some of those companies that have had this problem, and that when there is an issue, we're not doing things like silencing those that come out about the issue, which is, despite, I, I know that Aline mentioned that Riot has publicly said that things are changing, and that may be true to some degree, but there is also the evidence that it might be more of a culture of silencing victims instead. And so there is kind of still a problem there. So that there needs to be a cultural shift and not just a saying, well, we're going to fix it, but we're going to just swipe it under the rug for now. And so um, there's, there's a lot of stuff that needs to go into it, but just making sure that you have that culture of excellence and implementing that locally first and then trying to expand it and going, because esports is just such a community, that I can go to California and like I did a couple weeks ago and talk to people about esports and know what they're talking about and everything and become good friends with people that I meet in an airport. Um, the same thing can be done at a community level and a company level of that culture just needs to be spread everywhere and kind of making sure that everywhere exhibits that culture of excellence that might not be the case all, everywhere right now. So. Uh, I know that was a long-winded answer to the question, but yeah. I've had some people also say, like, well, we've been talking about it in our own um, department, that we wonder whether or not something like Twitch or some of the other companies can't do something about some of the language or things that does happen, you know, in the Twitch chat. We wanted to show a Twitch chat to some of our students, and we had to literally cut the chat out, right, because we were afraid of what might come up. Um, and in the, these companies as well, like Twitch, need to be have some responsibility for making sure that that doesn't happen, or if somebody is doing that and gets reported that they're shut down. I don't know. I know it's all about the money, but. <laughs> well, I also want to follow that up, and I think what we're doing here right now is part of the solution, right? I mean, I think ultimately, part of it is you. Success is a great motivator, right? And I think there, at some point, we don't want to invite girls because we feel sorry for them. We want to invite women because they rock, because they're awesome, and they're awesome often in different ways than male players. And I think when we show that, when we demonstrate these communities that are built upon excellence, that has its own persuasive appeal. And I think the more that we do that, and the more we continue to promote these kinds of activities, that will spread, that has a force in and of itself. So I think we're, we're engaged in part of the solution, even by doing something like this. I'm gonna throw my two cents in one more time too. I, this is getting really long, guys. Uh, but you hit on, a, everybody, everybody's hitting on a really good point with the focus on girls in gaming here tonight, uh, and more females in gaming. Um, and Eric brings up a really good point, is we don't want to invite women because we feel sorry that they're like about all of this, and of course we do, but that shouldn't be the motivator. The motivator should be that they want to play. And uh, this is a good spot to correct something uh, earlier. I'm actually an electrical engineering major, not, not a comp sci major. Um, I didn't quite make it through the fix in the transcript. Um, but in engineering, there's also not a whole lot of women. This isn't because we pick on women in engineering. This isn't because we, we uh, out them as inferior to us. This is just because there isn't a lot of women in engineering. It could be due to any a number of factors. It could be just to, due to the fact that women aren't interested in engineering. Um, whether it be either of those things, 
um, I think it's important to remember that that um, the motivator should be that everybody should be interested in the game. It shouldn't be a forced inclusion. Thank you. Are there any other questions from the audience? Um, I wanted to go back. I wanted to go back to uh, when we were talking about revenue for the Twitch streamers and stuff like that. And I was curious, from the side of avid gamers or non-avid gamers on the panel or in the room, um, do you think that Twitch streamers, with the surplus amount of money that they've been making these days, is too much for video gamers to be making compared to other professions, or too little, or? Yeah, I, I think it's for the for the most part it's donation sponsorships a mixture of both as well as uh, you if you partner with Twitch by getting a certain amount of uh, influence then you can um, make revenue off of the ads uh, that are played during your streams as well but um, whether that's too much I I don't believe so I think it's the you have to put a committed effort out there to build your uh, streaming success um, and build a name for yourself. It's very much like any other entertainment industry. Um, you look at movie stars, uh, musicians, that sort of thing. Um, the money they're making can be comparable, and that's because they went out and they built their brand from the bottom up. And the same thing is being said of streamers. So um, you look at Ninja, and he streamed for six years bef before even getting 10,000 viewers, but because he was good enough at what he did and persisted at it for six years, he was able to sustain himself but not have extra money by any means if you look at his story. And then he ended up with Fortnite finding a game that he was really good enough at to build a brand that was consistently growing enough to where Drake approached him, and that's where things kind of took off from there. And so um, to say that they're making too much I think is not correct is not the correct wording. I think that it is more of uh, an entertainment industry that not necessarily too much, but it's all based on the effort. So if you're putting in a lot of effort, you're going to make quite a bit, and that might be something that even small-time streamers might end up being a little bit jealous, might be a little bit of a harsh word for it, but you know, it, it does tend to be something that you you got to put in the effort and when you do it might pay off like that and that's something that I think you have to kind of respect about their craft to say the least. I'll just jump in on that real quick. I think Connor said a, a really important point where he said if, if you want to think about this through the lens of the entertainment industry like there's not like a, a salary cap on how much Drake can make for having a concert right like there's a person's salary limit is going to be based on what the market will pay them. Now if it's 5, 10, 15 years down the line and esports gets quote unquote organized enough where they have leagues where there are collective bargaining agreements between the organizations that run them and the players themselves. Yeah, then you might have salary caps like in the NBA. But if you're popular enough as an esport athlete to be like LeBron James, he makes like 25% of his income is based on his on court salary. 75% of it is based on endorsements and sponsorship deals and his own investment. So you could see a structure set up like that where maybe there is determined, okay, this is your, you're making too much. Here's what we're going to limit your salary as an eSport athlete, but go ahead and be in all these endorsement commercials and, and start up your own companies that people are going to invest in because you are a famous eSport e athlete. I think that could be something that's coming down the pike. But Someone's probably going to want you to have a microphone. There he comes. So I did a uh, pretty intense research on Twitch. Um, as Eric knows, he was, he was helping us out with that. But um, one thing that's important to understand is that a lot of really successful Twitch streamers do charity work as well. So it's not just about getting the money. Um, these people contribute back, and they do raffles and giveaways. Like it is, it's very intense. It takes. They have to do overlays. They have to create their own intros. All of this is very complicated work. Um, so I think that maybe they're not just playing games. There's a whole setup to this. There's a script. There's a lot of aspects that we're not looking at. You would need to have a broadcasting degree to really pull it off right away. And even then, you have to make sure that people actually like you. Um, there's a great streamer that I like named Co Carnage, and he initially, same story, he wasn't very successful. 
And then all of a sudden people just started loving him because he changed up his personality. So you have to assume a persona most of the time. You're performing. You are, the gaming industry is the entertainment industry. It is the highest generating of revenue. It outdoes the movie and music industry combined on its own, just by selling games. So that's something to think about, I think, too. It's just the way that we conceive of entertainment. And, and real quick, to go with that persona, and I know that we're running a little long on time, but um, to talk about that persona, you know, I had the opportunity a couple of weeks ago to attend League of Legends summer finals for North America in Oakland. Um, and at that event, I met... Uh, one of the most famous, maybe the most, uh, between top two, um, mo most famous streamers for League of Legends, whose name is Tyler One. And his persona in game is that he is an incredibly, I'll, I'm just going to say it, terrible person in game. Um, he, is, he is, His claim to fame was that he got a permanent ban not on his account, but on him as a person playing League of Legends. Um, so Riot Games told him that if they saw him streaming League of Legends, they would ban the account they saw him streaming on site. So that means that he lost any money he put into the account. He lost any experience he gained on it um, because he was just so terrible of a person towards other people, and he was ruining games that often. But... Um, even though his persona has sort of shifted since he's been reinstated, um, he's quote unquote reformed his persona. Um, so now he's more of, he's an alpha male persona and he still has those aspects of being sort of toxic, but he has reformed it to some degree. But when I met him in person, which is my entire point, his persona that he shows on stream, yes, he was showing it, but it kind of slipped up that he's a genuinely likable guy. Like, I I went up to him, and I he resides in the middle of Missouri, and I had, as was kind of mentioned in the intro, I did a year at the University of Missouri, and so I went up to him and I said, hey, nice to meet another Midwestern guy out here. I mean, it's Oakland. You don't see too many Midwestern people out there. Um, and so he was like, oh, really, where are you from? I said, I'm from Northern Illinois, and he said, oh, okay, what, what city? I said, well, I, I grew up in Rockford, that area. And he's like, oh, I know where Rockford is. I was born in Illinois. I was like, oh, I didn't know that about you. Really, really cool to know that. And I was like, well, I went to a, a year at the University of Missouri, so that since that's only about an hour away from where he lives. And he was like, oh, okay, that's really cool. Nice to, nice to meet someone that was down there too. And he, he said, uh, so you said you went to it. And I said, yeah, I, I transferred out of it. And he said, well, you know, you know, school can be tough sometimes. And, you know, he just genuinely had a, a conversation with me that the personality that he shows on stream and that people like about him uh, because it sometimes can be showing emotions that people don't typically want to show when they, have, when they play games. Um, that persona that they like didn't show at all in that conversation, which is something that I didn't think was possible. I thought that that was actually his demeanor because he was so good at that persona. So th you have to find a way to kind of have a character that you play, and it's kind of acting in a way to how they stream. So, yeah. Okay, thank you very much, everyone. Before we uh, wrap up, I have one more question for you, and don't answer yet. Um, I want you to think, uh, what non-competitive game do you hold dear in your heart or you're looking forward to? Uh, for example, for me, I will always have a, a candle lit for Half-Life 3. It'll never happen, but um, it's there. <laughs> so think about that. In the meantime, I want to say that each of our presenters will get this lovely, we call it stemware, from STEM Outreach, Pint Glass. And if you guys... Uh, present three more times, we'll have a full set. So each one of you guys will get one of these at the end. On your tables, you'll see that you just have quite a few things. Uh, I think one of the most important ones is our survey. Please let us know what you like, what you just want to see more of, what we can do differently, what topics you have in mind. Go ahead and fill this out and leave it on the table and we can collect it afterwards. You'll also find our save the date cards for both STEM Fest and the Maker Fair. Both events are on October 27th. It's free. Parking's free. Everything's free. Go have a great time. And before STEM Fest, we have uh, our next STEM Cafe on October 23rd. It's all about the past, present, and future of anatomy and synthetic biology. Also, feel free to take 
a handful of our lovely eSports stickers. Okay. Which we have a lot. <laughs> <laughs> so many. So, panelists, what are our uh, dearest and nearest games? Uh, and Mario Kart for the oh, DS. Nice. That was that game was top of the line stuff. You weren't cool unless you owned it in elementary school. I I didn't really uh, play too many video games until I got into esports, but um, the non-competitive sides of like FIFA and that sort of sports games have always been my thing, or racing games. Um, and real quick, sorry, I just want to throw a plug out there for anybody viewing that might be interested in the esports club. Uh, we do have meetings going on every other. Friday, uh, we have our land meetings, and those run from six to nine. Uh, you can find more information on those on our Facebook page, which is just NIU Esports Club. Thanks, guys. I'm gonna have to go a tie between Fallout and um, Oblivion. My parents didn't let me play video games <laughs> as a kid, <laughs> but my babysitter had the original Nintendo, so some fond memories playing on that, I guess. I think the first video game that I really got interested in was Myst. <laughs> All right, thank you panelists, thank you audience, and thank you Twitch audience. Have a great night. Feel free to come and talk to our panelists after the end, so uh, if you have any questions for one-on-one, -on -one. and have a great night, thank you.